Summer, the perfect time to tie up loose ends in the workshop and get things ready to grab September by the balls. But before making autumn squeal, I have a precision stop for the milling machine that has been on the back burner for far too long, a rotary table that needs a complete teardown, and a pile of garbage that needs to go, so that I can give you a sneak peek around the shop. If you are familiar with the cheap made depth stop of import RF45 styles milling machine, you already know why I want to replace it. If you're not, just know they are as appealing to use as a condom wrapped in barbed wire, and equally useful. The core idea of how to fix this is genius, because it doesn't come from me, but from Stefan Gottenswinter. It's a solid steel bar, precisely fitted through the casting and connected to the quill. Then you have a slider with a locking system. You set it at a precise distance from the contact surface, lock it, and you have your depth stop. There are a few challenges though, like the fact that the hole in the casting has been sized at random and probably bored using a tiny shovel, or that the inside of the casting is a reference surface as much as Charles Manson is a role model. So I'll start machining a sleeve to precisely fit a 15 mm steel bar into the casting. The bore in the casting is between 17.20 and 17.18 mm, and the surface is pretty rough. So I'm aiming to machine the OD of the sleeve 17.178, a very, very tight fit that should keep the sleeve in place. And I'm doing so using my cheap milling machine as a lathe and a $2 insert. It should be pretty fun. I start by taking a few test cuts to find a reliable depth of cut, such that what I'm reading on the DRO is reliably happening on the steel. And the butter zone seems to be about 20 microns on the diameter. So I rough things out to a hair over 1mm from final measure, aka 1.06mm. Then I switch the insert to a fresh point, take a first cut at 0.26mm and finish up with 4 cuts of 0.20mm each, which should land me exactly on target. The secret is that taking consistent cuts makes the behavior of the material more consistent, granting more accurate results. While trying to sneak to a dimension with lighter and lighter cuts, it's like throwing dice and hope to hit the mark. And would you look at that, 17.176. But it's a bit early to get the tent up and go camping, there's still the central board to take care of. The bar I have is fairly consistent, slightly over 15 mm, so I'll go for a 15.02 mm bore for a, an easy slide fit. At first I tried to use a boring bar to avoid concentricity problems, but I couldn't get it to cut, so I switched to the more sober boring head. However, in machining experience is important, and experience has taught me that even if everything's centered, the drill bits I never sharp like to drill for thou off center. So before sending the boring head on its way, I first measure the error and correct the position with the DRO so that the hole is concentric with the outside. Then the same principle of finishing the bore with consistent cuts for reliably accurate results still applies. Another thing that has immensely improved my boring life is to ignore the microscopic dial on my cheap boring head and set the diameter with an indicator. It feels like switching from a bucket and a handful of nettles to a luxury bathroom with pure silk wipes. Seriously, it barely takes any time to set up and you always know where you're at. For me, it's totally worth it. And the final result is 15.018. I mean, I could blush. So yeah, this thing might look like a third, but it's the most accurate third I've ever machined in my life. And as they say, the proof 
is in the casting. Next, we make the slider, which is just a piece of steel bored with the same slide fit and slitted for clamping. However, to setting it up with any sort of precision, we need to work around the uneven internal surface of the casting. My solution is a 1 plus 3 pin system, which means having one reference pin on one reference point that I can set with a stack of gauge blocks, plus three pins for stability, so that the slider doesn't tilt on the reference pin when the quill puts it under load. To level the three stability pins, I have them primed with Loctite 648 and the hole have plenty of depth clearance. So when I gently bring the reference pin in contact, the other three pins set on the shape of the casting and the Loctite does the rest. And it feels really solid. I can see some flex when I crank on the handle, but it could very well be the flexing of the whole machine. Doesn't really matter though. It's plenty accurate for what I need, and it's not meant to be a permanent solution anyway. What you're looking at is a beautiful piece of scrap from the 80s. And there's also a rotary table of about the same age that likes to wobble when turning around. I'm 98% sure the wobble is due to bad assembly, because despite the age, the rotary table doesn't seem to have seen much use. Plus, I'm the one responsible for putting back together a few years back, and I'm 100% sure I didn't know what I was doing. There is no branding on this rotary table, but the parts feel pretty high quality and well machined. All in all, is as basic as a rotary table can get. There's the table the casting of the body and the retention ring on the bottom. The worm screw is hardened and it's machined to be a tight fit in this cast iron bushing, which is eccentric so it can be disengaged from the main gear and pulled out after loosening this clamp. To see if there's anywhere, I test just the table and the casting and I get basically no movement on the indicator. So the wobble I get when it's sold together must come from the uneven tension in the retention ring and the eccentric lead screw. So I just have to put it back together with more care and it will be ready to go. My only issue with this thing is that aside for this part on the crank bushing, there is no lubrication system for the table which leads me to think it was intended to be greased but that goes against everything i've been told about lubricating machinery so while i'm brushing grease under the table with trembling hands i feel like i'm drawing a beard on the mona lisa with a permanent marker but i don't know what else to do no piece of this thing has any trace that could lead me to a maintenance manual. So if you have any experience with a similar rotary table, please let me know because I would really need some advice here. Anyway, after prepping the rotary table like a cow in labor, I snug the ring in position and level it using an indicator and these set screw. The catch is that if you put too much tension, the ring deforms and the leading screw doesn't really want to fall in the right position. Plus, it's a pretty fiddly process, almost as interesting to watch as paint drying. I'll take my time off camera, but it's okay. Now I'm sure there's nothing wrong with the table. Plus, <laughs> I kind of forgot to put in the brake before sliding the table into the casting so I have to take it back apart anyway. So I was able to put my greedy little talons on this place because shortly after World War II, someone decided it was a good idea to build a garage that could easily host two cars, but with a door too small for most cars in existence. Quite a drag if you're into cars but my great-grandfather was into books. 
So he filled the place to the rim with books, quite literally. These were all bookcases. After the books were gone, this basically became the family damping ground for those kind of things that you know you'll never use again in your life, but you don't quite feel like throwing it away definitively yet. I wish I had a picture to show you, but you have to imagine this whole place, this whole space filled to the ceiling with the crap of the ages, unused, neglected and forgotten. And at a certain point I simply carved my way in just by stuffing my car with crap. One painful journey to the landfill at the time. And what you're witnessing here is the final stretch of years of the cluttering. For the very first time, I won't share this space with a pile of garbage. So it's the perfect moment to give you a tour of the workspace. The general idea is to have this side of the workshop for grinding and that side for machining. And in the center, there's my poor excuse for a welding table, which at the moment is serving as a glorified stand for the bandsaw. Currently, it's held in place only by its own weight, but in a not so far away future, I'd like to make some proper legs for this thing and turn it into a fully functional workbench for scraping, filing, and the occasional welding. On the machine side, I have my import milling machine, which is decently sized. I like more Z travel, but you know, you get what you get. And in the future, I'd like to make a complete rebuild of this thing, but even as it is out of the box, it can do a lot of pretty cool stuff. The real weak spot of this thing is the anemic speed and the erratic speed selection, which would fit better a $50 drill press with an erectile dysfunction rather than a proper milling machine. But hey, it has a DRO, which kind of makes up for the vomit-inducing state of the dials. Next to the mill, I have the surface plate that I keep on top of this ugly dresser. Here I keep end mills, drill bits, files and many other out of focus tools. And here on the far right, there's the steel corner. Nothing is really organized yet, but since it's all low carbon steel, there isn't much to organize anyway. On the left of the milling machine, I have my little machinist tool chest with collets and drill bits, uh, some tooling here on the right, strum clump on the left, and inside I've got my measuring, tooling, and parallels, and those kind of stuff. This tool cart right here is one of my favorite things because it prevents me from disseminating every tool I own across the workshop. Everything is there and I can bring it wherever I want, wherever I need it. On the grinding side, I only have the belt grinder I made in 2016 to make knives, which is a total ripoff of the TW90. Of course, it's a lot clunkier than any <laughs> machine made by Travis, but I did my best to put all the bells and whistles I could to have a very versatile tool. Sadly, it's not that great for machining. I still have a few spare parts though, so in the future I could redesign a grinder of my own more suited for my machining needs. The last part of the shop is this back wall, which is general storage with wood, more steel, and these shelves where I got all sorts of things like glue and zip ties, electrical stuff, pneumatic stuff, tubes, bolts, screws, all sorts of mixed crap. The plan is to sieve through all this stuff, reduce the shelves at just two columns, and then eventually have some sort of organizing system for nuts, bolts and stuff, but we'll see in the future. And this is it. I hope you had fun. I hope you'll enjoy your summer and I'll see you back in September when a much civilized season will take over. Bye bye.